Well, I want to begin by sharing that six years ago, I entered what I think has been the most difficult time of my life so far. Uh, Courtney and I were expecting our third and fourth babies, and our apartment that we lived in in Vancouver uh, didn't have any more closets to transform into baby rooms, so we had to move into a a house that we were going to rent. And uh, there were some major complications at that time with Courtney, and so she was in the hospital uh, months before the due date uh, of the the twins that were coming. So I tried to juggle the one-year-old and a three-year-old and working full-time and trying to visit Courtney as much as I could. And thankfully, when Courtney experienced a life-threatening emergency, she was still in the hospital, and so the the babies were were born. They needed to, to take them out right away. And so we were a little bit caught off guard having these twins two months early. And so while they were still in the hospital, we were scrambling to buy an affordable vehicle that would fit our whole family at this point. And uh, finally, after a month or so, we were all at home again. We were just happy to be home, even though everywhere we went, we still needed to take two vehicles for all of us to get there. Uh, But we were glad to be home. And then a month later, the week after Christmas, our basement flooded. And uh, we were forced to, to move out while the damage was being fixed. And so the insurance company thought I was joking when they said, so, so do you need a, a crib? And I said, actually, we need three. And they laughed like that. And then they stopped and thought, oh, we got to go buy some cribs. And so they were, they were setting them up as we showed up to this house that we were able to, to, to have for a time. And it's one thing to have the chaos of infants and toddlers at your own home or even just in general. But when we walked into this house, Courtney and I looked at each other in horror because there were expensive antiques everywhere. And this house was from top to bottom, fancy, perfectly white furniture and carpet, as if there's never been a kid in that house before. And within 48 hours, we all had the flu. And and so I remember feeding the twins in the middle of the night, completely exhausted, wondering how much more of this that I could take. And those renovations ended up taking three months instead of the three weeks that they told us. And so every week they would say, it's going to be another week. And we go back to the other house to get more diapers and and everything that we needed, bring bring it back to this new house where we were not knowing when we would be done. And it was just this exhausting traveling back and forth, trying to figure it out, even though it's temporary, not knowing how long it was going to be. And when It was finally completed. We got back to this rental house and we celebrated, Courtney and I, by both of us getting pneumonia. And then this was at the same time where we returned and our landlord had to uh, reimburse us for some of the money that we had paid them, but they willfully said, no, they're not going to do this for the thousands of dollars. And we were living on a tight budget at the time and this just made it even more hard for me to think of how am I going to provide for my family? And all the while this is going on, there were some, some things going on, some shocking developments at the church I was working at, which kind of flipped everything upside down. And they were restructuring, and so I was being moved from one ministry to another, and so I had to start working on that one while finishing uh, the busiest season of this previous one. But meanwhile, at the same time, we found another house that we could live in that hopefully had less issues. And so we moved at the very same time, again, with these four children. And, and so it was just this... This, the trials of regular life just piling up, and then these other things that were added to it, making it more and more difficult, and, and it was just a, a, a ridiculous time in a way. And in the end, after all of this, I had a nervous breakdown, and I needed to take medical leave from work for a few months, and then you remember that apartment that I, we started in, it, it burned down. And this is all true. This was a whole year of our life. And I just, I remember being so completely broken at that moment and severely depressed. And and I, it took a while before I was able to function normally after this, this whole thing happened. And I remember Courtney will still tell me things that I did, things that I couldn't do anymore. And I don't have any recollection of it. And I remember when I was finally mentally able to read again. I sat down and I opened my Bible to James and I read verse 2 in chapter 1 and this is what it said, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. And I don't know what you do. No doubt you've gone through trials, 
small, big, whatever they might be. Maybe you're in one right now. And this is the encouragement that we get from James. Count it all joy. I don't know what you do with a verse like that. Here's what I did. I stopped reading. And I prayed to God. I said, God, this time you're going to need to prove it. And over the next few months, while I was off work, and as I've continued throughout life, God has shown me exactly what he intends to say through James here. Something that I will never forget. Something that became my source of joy in the midst of every trial, even depression and anxiety, and for every trial that I will ever face again. And my hope this morning is that God will help us to see and to trust the truth of his word in order that his church, that we as believers here, would be filled with unshakable joy in the midst of any trial that may come into our lives. And this is because our faith is in Christ, the sure and steadfast anchor of our souls. So let's read James chapter 1, verses 2 to 12 together. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a, like a flower of the, of the grass he will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. And so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits." Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So James is, as he writes these words, he's well aware of what the Christians that he's writing to are going through. As we go through this letter, we're going to notice that some of them are orphans, some of them are widows, that they need to take care of them. There is poverty talked about in this letter. Some are being dragged into court. Some are poorly clothed, lacking in daily food. And there was a great famine at this time or around this time that we learn about in the book of Acts. And so when they were so poor that when they worked each day, if their employer didn't pay them at the end of that day, they may not have enough money to buy enough food. And it says that some were getting severely sick and others had even died. And so the vast majority of these Christians that James is writing to are suffering because of persecution that broke out and they fled Jerusalem and they had to start their lives over. They're going through these massive trials and they hadn't gotten very far. And so we read in James, he goes through this introduction very quickly and he wants to get to the body of his letter and the first two words in the Greek sentence, they're allowed to to, to move these words wherever they feel like it. Sometimes they put them at the front for emphasis And the first two words he says to them are all joy. That's what he says to them. And for people that are going through trials of any kind, to to hear these words, it might actually sound offensive. It might sound confusing. Like, do you understand what I'm going through? And it could sound unhelpful in the first place. And perhaps this is why Pastor John, in our staff meeting this week, he heard the verses, we read them together, what we were going to preach, and he leans over, and I think he prophesied to Connor, saying, I bet he doesn't get past verse 2. And he might be right. We'll see. Because this is a verse that, that we're supposed to be joyful in our trials, but that's not easy for us to do. We need to understand what James is really saying. Because when people come into my office, and they say that they're struggling with infertility, or they lost their job, or there's some trial that they're going through that they, that they don't know what to do, the first thing I say to them is not count it all joy. And when people share with me that, that they're walking through a battle with cancer with a family member, or there's just overwhelmed, they're just overwhelmed with the trials of life, the responsibilities that they need to go through, or that they're addicted to alcohol or pornography, I don't offer them a high five. 
This is not normal. And so we need to understand rightly what James is actually saying here in verse 2. And Pastor John may be onto something, but I will get past verse 2. Because if you'll notice in verse 2, there is no hope. It tells us what to do, but why should we even do it? We have to go to verse 3 and verse 4. So what I want to do is let James uh, give him a chance. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's, let's hear him out and understand what it is that he's actually saying. So he's telling us here in verse 2 that when we meet trials of various kinds, we are to count them all joy. So that's the, that's the command that he's giving us. But then he gives his motives, his reasons for this in verse 3. Verse 3 says, For you know that the testing of your faith is producing steadfastness. So the reason why we can have joy in our trials is because of what it's producing in us. But you look at that word, steadfastness, and unless that's what you want in your life, if you've been thinking today, man, I wish I could be more steadfast, then there's a reason for joy. But it might be a word that we need to understand better. It might be a word that, that unless we actually want to become more steadfast, we're still disheartened and discouraged by James's uh, response to these trials. Steadfast, another contemporary synonym might be endurance that we should be endurance, or that at least that's what it's producing in us when our faith is tested. But this is less about the act of enduring and more about the will to endure. That's what James is saying. That when we go through these trials, it's testing our faith and it's building in us the will to endure all these difficulties that may come in our lives. It's what's going on in our minds. That's what he's talking about. So, for example, let's take the worst form of punishment that we can think of, like going for a run. <laughs> this, <laughs> this requires endurance, and even after a few minutes, if we get that far, we're already wanting to give up. I mean, we, we have so many excuses. This doesn't feel good. I don't feel good. I have a cramp. I would rather do laundry. There's, there are endless reasons why we don't want to run. And yet the endurance that is required isn't so much the physical ability to do it, but what's going on in our minds that, we're, that, that we are being attacked by this doubt, attacked by this temptation to just stop, to give up. And the steadfastness that James is talking about is what helps us stick with it and pushes us one more step and one more step. It's, it's perseverance in the midst of adversity. And we know in this life that there are so many things that come against us. So many things that make our life more difficult. And while every part in this example, and while every part of our body is screaming to stop, steadfastness is that battle to keep going. It's the will to endure. And so if we're honest with ourselves, more than just in running we would probably be better off being more steadfast as people in all of life, in our trials, in our temptations, in all of these ways, but it's probably still not at the top of our Christmas list. We'd still want other things more than steadfastness. And so James goes to verse 4, and he says, Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And now it gets interesting. Because we see here that steadfastness is working in us, if we'll let it, in making us, these are his words, perfect and complete. Is that what we want? I think we're all aiming for that. We would love that. And we need to understand what that even means. But which one of us doesn't want to be perfect and be complete? Both of these words are very similar, but they're distinct in a, in a, in a small way. To be perfect refers to the goal, the purpose, to say you've achieved your purpose. And the word for complete refers to the parts, that all the parts are there. So imagine yourself, you come home from Ikea, you have a brand new chair, but it's, it's all in pieces. You open the box and you have this picture that you never actually get to. It shows you what it should be like, and then you've got to put it together. And so let's imagine for a moment that one of the chair legs that you had was broken. And so you put it all together, but one of them was broken, and it couldn't actually hold anything up. It would just fall over. In that case, it wouldn't be perfect. It wouldn't achieve its intended purpose. And if, if one of those pieces was missing, and you put this chair together, it might still work, but it's not complete. 
And so this is the way that James is using these words. He's saying that you will be complete. You will lack nothing. And you will be perfect. You will do what you've been designed to do. And this is where steadfastness is leading us. And this is how we need to understand where James is taking us. The Bible makes, it, makes us all aware, every believer, as we read it, that God, by His Holy Spirit, is working on us. None of us are what we are supposed to be. And so God, by His Spirit, is working. And by definition, or rooted in our salvation, is the fact that we're sinful. We're not who God designed us to be. And so God is saving us. He's freeing us from enslavement to sin. And He's transforming us to become like Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, God is at work in you. And this is a good thing. We need this to be happening. And it's in Philippians chapter 1 where we get our confidence. And it says this, that he who began a good work in you will continue to perfect it, there's that word, until the day of Christ Jesus. And so it's no secret that we are not perfect. We are not there yet. But God is doing this in such a way that when Christ returns, we will be perfect. But the other part of this is that God isn't waiting until that day to get started on perfecting us. So there's progress that we need to make. And and in Philippians, it also says that it is God who works in you to will and to act on behalf of his good purpose. So this is his purpose for us. He is perfecting us and he's helping us within us that our will changes, that we begin to act in line with God and what he is doing. And so the Holy Spirit, who dwells within every believer, is shaping us and transforming us into His own image. And this work of sanctification is great, but it's not just God who's doing the work. That same verse in Philippians says that each individual Christian is to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so we have a part to play in this as we live our lives and as God by His power is transforming us. This is God's purpose for your life. If you wanted a purpose, this is it. He is making you more like Christ and we need to be a part of that process. You'll probably know the verse in Romans that adds to, as it talks about these things. It speaks about the process. It says, all things, so that's everything, our trials, everything, work together for good, for those who have been called according to God's purpose. And so that's believers. We've been called. And now what is this good purpose of God? It is the rest of that verse. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, and there it is, to be conformed to the image of his son. This is what God is doing. He intends to to, to make you perfect and complete like his son. That's where we're headed, and that's when we get there, when God has done his work in us, we will be, as James says, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But the way that God has decided to get us there is the thing that trips us up. And just like in Hebrews chapter 5, it tells us that Jesus, in his human nature, it says, learned obedience through what he suffered. That's how he learned obedience, and so it is with the children of God. And so there's books, there's articles, there's things that we could read, and we could talk about this, and they use different terms. They call it Christian growth, or maturity, or sanctification, or obedience, or Christ-likeness, whatever you want to call it. Since the moment that you put your faith in Christ, since the moment that you were saved, the Holy Spirit was given to you to be in you and transforming you to become more like Christ. In other words, to become more steadfast and to let that work. And I wonder how many of us have goals in life that actually align with what God has purposed for us. That throughout our whole lives, this is one of the things, one of the primary ways that God is working through us and in us. And so now that we've gotten to the end of verse 4, we see this picture of what James is, is getting to. That we want to be perfect, we want to be complete, we want to be like our Savior and Lord And so now we work backwards to see how he gets to joy in our trials. With this in mind, we can understand why James is talking like this. He sets before us our ultimate goal in verse 4, that we would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so that prospect, that when you hear about this and you read about this, 
That you can be more like your Savior, more like Christ. This should excite you. This should be your mission in life. This is what God has called us to. And this should motivate us to do whatever it takes to get there. And it should make us, perhaps like Paul in Philippians also, he says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he sees where God is taking him, and that's where he wants to go. And so should we. And God's working on us to not just get there, but to even desire to get there. And with our greatest desire before us, James commands us not to abort the mission. He says in verse 4, let steadfastness have its full effect. And I think he says this because we so often don't let it have its full effect. Whenever trials come into our lives, whenever there's difficulty, we often try to avoid it, don't we? When something starts to hurt, we stop immediately. We don't like pain. We don't like suffering of any kind. But James is saying that the work of steadfastness in our lives is like God's prescription to make you more like Christ. So we need to understand what God is doing here so that we will let this medicine, the steadfastness, let the medicine have its full effect. And we need to trust God that he has a good treatment plan. And we have to trust that the great physician has given us the the exact dose that we need. There's a trust involved in God as we go through these trials. And so we need to let steadfastness have its full effect. And when we don't trust God, we often stop it. We stop it early. We stop it as early as we can because we can't endure. We don't want to endure. But this is how God is perfecting us. And James reminds us of the desirable benefits, the the expected result in that we would be perfect and complete to where we long to be, where we were created to be, and to lack nothing to be able to carry out that purpose. That's where he's taking us. But will we let steadfastness have its full effect? Now go backwards to verse 3. It tells us where we get steadfastness. So it it comes, and then we're supposed to let it work. But where does it come from? It comes from the testing of our faith. The test of faith here is not to find out whether you have faith or not, but to strengthen the faith that you already have. So, So it's not a litmus test, it's a workout. And what God is doing is he's exercising our faith to grow it, to make it stronger. And so like, just like when we exercise, the more you push yourself to the edge of what you're capable of, and you push as hard as you can, the stronger you're going to become. But you have to get yourself there. And in the same way, God is like our personal trainer of our faith. And he's pushing us to the edge where we feel like, I don't know if I can trust God here. I don't know if, if he'll come through for me. And when we do trust him, we rely on him and he comes through, our faith in him grows. And it's strengthened. And the next time a trial comes, we will grow again. But we'll be able to exercise what we've just strengthened. And this is God's process to perfect you and I. This is how God has designed it. We don't get to change the plan on him. This is what he's doing. The problem is we don't want to let him do it. And so this really comes down to how much we're going to trust God through this process. Maybe it's helpful to think of a of an analogy here, uh, when we think about how strong your faith is. Have you ever tried to think about that? Like, what, what kind of faith do I have? The question is, how steadfast are you? So when trials come into your life, how quickly do you just want to give up and think that, oh, there's nothing good that can come from this? Or, or how long can you trust that God is good and he's got a good purpose in this, whether I understand it or not? When, when trials come into your life, how, how quickly, how quickly do, you, do you think that he's out to get you? Are you thinking that God is, ah, he wouldn't have let this happen. He must be against me. Or, or maybe he's stopped being faithful to the promises that he's made to bless me. They're over now. How quickly do we despair rather than see this as God being wise and giving us exactly what we need in our lives in this very moment? Whether we understand why Suffering and hardship has to come into our lives and and we question whether he is still good. How long do you last? 
And my hope is that over time, what God is doing in this process is that you're lasting longer. And we talked about what steadfastness is. It's that will to endure these things. And you think that the more godly, perhaps the, more, the people with more faith are the ones that can go through these trials, not because they're easy, but because they trust God further into them than others. And so if we understand it this way, perhaps the reason why your faith may be weak is because you're not exercising it. Remember, faith isn't just simply wishing that something is true or, or just believing, thinking that God is going to come through and you just don't, you don't trust Him. You just let Him do His work or you think that it's all going to turn out well in the end. No, faith, Hebrews 11 says, it calls it genuine faith, the assurance that you are assured of something, that you have a conviction of something. And so this, when we talk about faith, it's how much confidence you have, not in yourself in this moment, but in God to carry you through this moment. It's not a wish, it is a confidence. And the way that we build this confidence in God is by testing it. That's where these tests of faith come in. It's the exercise. So these are opportunities to grow your faith. And the more you look to God, you're going through the trial, you're, you're trusting, it seems to be okay, you get to the point where you don't think you can trust anymore, and it pushes you further and further, and when you look to God, and He comes through for you, your, your faith is being strengthened. But we've got to do it. It doesn't just happen. We've got to trust Him. And this means that if you don't look to God, if you would rather search the internet for a solution to your problem. Or you'd look up the podcast that has the same, talks about the same thing that you're going through. And it doesn't point you to the scriptures. Or maybe you ask your friends for advice, but they don't point you to God. They're pointing you elsewhere. Or maybe you just avoid it. Sometimes we do that. We just escape into our phones and say, I'm not dealing with this. Every time we look away from God, we don't give our faith the chance to grow, to be strengthened. Doesn't mean it's easy. But this is the way that God is doing this. God is perfecting us through steadfastness, by testing our faith. And then if we go back one more verse to verse 2, this is what trials are doing. Trials are getting us to perfect us, are getting us to complete us, to be lacking in nothing. And these profitable faith-building exercises are what come about in our trials. So what kind of trials could we expect this from? To build our faith. Is it only those that come about because we are followers of Jesus? That does it have to be persecution or can it be something else? Like, like what if you get stuck in the snow and you're late for an important meeting? Is our faith tested in something like that? Or, or what about you're, you're worried about your teenager that they should be home an hour ago and they're still not here? Does, is that related to faith somehow? We can go on and on about all these trials and James would say yes to everything. Yes, anything that comes into your life that makes it more difficult is a test of your faith. And I want to show you how this works. But the way that James talks about it here is he wants us to think about this in broad terms. To think about more trials rather than less trials or only specific ones. Because he uses words like, when you meet trials of various kinds. He's not pinpointing anything. He's opening it up for us to understand this. In the Greek, if you were to literally read this, it would say something like this. When you stumble into troubles of any color. That, that's what he's saying. So anything. And we know that this world has all 16 million colors of trials. And many of us ha could, could name millions of them that we go through almost every day. All the time, there's something that is making our life more difficult. And so I want you to consider, just for an example, there's, there's so many ways that we could think about this, but, but, but parenting comes to mind. There, there's the trial of exhaustion for the parents when they're caring for an infant. There's the trial of telling a toddler for the millionth time, stop. There, there's the trial of worrying about who's influencing your kid at school. And there's the trial of your teenager perhaps saying that they don't think that this whole Jesus thing is real. There's the trial of worrying about your kids, that they're eating healthy and they're making friends and doing well as they're off now at college. And there's the trial of, of people with their grown children hoping one day, praying that their kids would come to faith and their families as well. All of these are trials and they're all related to faith. 
And here's how this works. It's because of who our faith is in. That in all of these circumstances, wherever you find yourself and anything that you're going through, the question is, will you trust God? Will you trust God's goodness in having us go through it? That he, that he would say, this is good for you. Do you trust God's wisdom that this is the way, this is the right way for you to get that good purpose, to make you more like Christ? To trust God's truth by saying, I don't know if obeying his word right now is actually going to help this situation, but you're going to trust him and continue to obey. Or trusting God's grace to be sufficient for you when you try something and it just fails, when you make mistakes. Or trusting God's sovereignty that he has the power to intervene into these situations when you pray. Or trusting God's strength to sustain us when we feel powerless. Or trusting God's love that he cares for us even through these dark moments in life. All of these things are testing our faith because they're all rooted in God and who he is. And so the question is, will we trust him? Christian faith doesn't mean that we get the power to fix all our problems and there's no more left. Like everything just goes well. That's not Christian faith. Christian faith, real faith, is that we trust the one who has that power and who will do it according to his promises and his faithfulness. Therefore, your faith, your individual faith, is only as strong as the God that you put your faith in. And James tells us here that every trial we face is going to test it. And the more that you rely on God, the more your assurance of His faithfulness will grow. And the more that that grows, the more steadfast you'll become. And the more steadfast you become, the more you're going to allow it to work. You're going to go farther into these trials than the last time. And the more you allow it to work, the closer you're becoming to being just like Christ. This is what God is doing. This is where the joy comes in at, the, at meeting the trial because we know what God is doing. And so when he says count it all joy, he's not saying that the trial is joy or the test is joy or even the steadfastness is the joy. The joy is the fact that God is working to perfect you and complete you, bringing about what you should also want, the ultimate purpose and goal in your life that you would then now be able to live in a way that is exactly what you have been intended to live for and that you would lack nothing, possessing everything you need to carry this out. And this is where God is going. And we should, even though we won't be there in this life, when, as we take steps, as we grow in our faith and our, our trust and our understanding of God, this should be our joy in what God is doing. This is why James can say, count it all joy. I know I said earlier that this was the verse that I came to, or these verses, when I was in what I think are my darkest moments in life so far. And what I realized here as I looked at these verses was what's so often missed when we read them. Do you notice that the word or the name God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit, it's not in there. The only thing that points us to God is this word faith. And these verses, because it's dependent upon faith, rely entirely upon God and what he's doing. That's where James is pointing us. And so the only way that you will ever see your trials as occasions for joy is when you trust in God entirely. And this is where these trials are taking us in the first place. And so it starts with knowing who God is according to his word. It's so important that we see him through the lens of Scripture, how he has revealed himself. And so this morning in our Christian education class, we asked the question, what is God? You may say you have faith in God, but if you don't know God as he has revealed himself in the Bible, then your faith won't be strong enough to even see the joy of your trials. You will have reason to despair, reason to question who God is, what's really going on in your life. But if you know him and you have faith in him as, as we talked about, the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything, how he is eternal and infinite, unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice and truth, and how nothing happens except through him and by his will, 
that when you have faith in a God like that, the God of the Bible, you will have joy in your trials. And James wouldn't say any of this. He wouldn't have commanded these things if God wasn't the God of the Bible. And we wouldn't be able to obey these things unless we believe that God is the God as he's described in the Bible. And so genuine faith, genuine faith, not just this word that we throw around, a wishing and hoping, but real confidence, single-minded, wholehearted trust in God is the prerequisite for joy that no trial can steal away from you. And so the living proof of your genuine faith, the way that we see this uh, carry out in our lives is that we have joy in God's purpose of our trials. We, we don't just hope that everything happens for a purpose. I know we say this, everything happens for a reason, but that's not trusting in Christ or in God. But we need to believe that God is perfectly sovereign over everything that takes place in our lives and that He's infinitely good and has good purposes over everything that takes place in our lives. And so our faith is, is seen. It becomes visible when you see trials as occasions for joy because God is making you more like Christ. This won't happen without faith, but this is what faith makes happen. Another living proof of your genuine faith is that you trust in God's process of your perfection. That we're not just thinking that, well, it'll all turn out in the end, hopefully, wishing. Again, it's a confidence. It's a confidence that God is perfectly wise to choose the best method to get you there. And that He's infinitely powerful that no matter what you're going through, He will get you there. And so our faith in God becomes visible, it's seen, when you endure trials longer this time than you did last time. This will not happen without faith, but this is what faith makes happen. And so our faith in God may not be complete until we see him face to face. But if you have faith, and Jesus says, even the size of a mustard seed, it says in Matthew 17, nothing will be impossible for you. And so just like our salvation, when we have faith, to be saved, it's not because it gives us the power to save ourselves. That's impossible. But we have faith in the one who does the work for us, and the impossible becomes possible through the divine power and grace of God. And so anyone here who understands Jesus, who sees him as the one who has lived for them and died for them and raised to back to life for them, for the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life, you will be saved. Not because your faith saves you, but because of your faith in the God who has done the work to save you. And this saving faith isn't ended, doesn't find its end at salvation. It's not over there, but it will continue to show itself and work itself out in our daily lives in these sorts of ways. And so we only got through three verses here. But they required our attention. And I think the rest of James is going to talk about more trials that we have to have this perspective to be able to see them as good. Not the trials themselves, but the God who is using them for our good. Because what James has in mind here is not some trite mantra that Christians are supposed to live by, that no matter how hard life gets, we smile harder. No. What James is offering us here is unshakable joy in an anchor that will never change, who is God himself. And when we cling to that anchor, to God in faith, then we will become as unshakable as he is, no matter what comes our way. And so let me just read verse 12. This is where we would end up. It says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. There's that word, steadfast, under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So may God make us steadfast. Let's pray. Father, forgive us when we don't trust you. And teach us by your word who you really are. And I pray that we as believers would be willing, would be strengthened in our faith
to step out in our trials, to not just give up, but to move forward in them, knowing that you have good purposes for us and the process is exactly the way that you've designed it. I know that all of us here are going through trials, even now, whether they're small or great. And I pray that we would be encouraged, not because we have it in ourselves, but because you have the power to lead us through them, to strengthen our faith, because you are perfect. You are exactly the one with the strength to get us through them. And so I pray that we as your people would not, would not think highly of ourselves, but put our place in submission to you and say, God, I need you. And we need you. And, and as you continue to, to, to come through for us, I pray that we would trust you more and more. And that we would allow these things in our lives, no matter how difficult they may be, with the perspective to see what you are doing and knowing that you have an ultimate grand purpose for us to make us perfect and complete according to your plan. And so I pray, Father, today and in our lives that we would make our faith visible to the watching world, that they would see how our faith in God is not about us, but it is about you. And I pray that you would strengthen our faith today. Make us steadfast, Father, that no matter what this church may go through, these believers in this room would go through, that they would be strengthened to trust you because you are unchanging in all of your characteristics. And we thank you, Father. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen.